Hey everyone, I'm Matthew Sheffield. Welcome to another episode of Theory of Change. Thanks for watching live and those of you watching on replay, hello to you as well. All right, well, so uh, we got a, another great program today uh, on an important topic, and uh, but I did want to remind everybody uh, in case you're new to the program that Theory of Change is part of the Flux Media Network and Flux is a new not-for-profit community uh, centric media organization where we are trying to find and elevate new voices, new topics, and give a perspective that isn't widely covered um, in mainstream politics. Um, so the address for that is flux.community. So please do check that out when you get a chance. Um, and of course, Theory of Change is archived on there as well. So uh, we got lots of um, episodes, uh, including full transcripts, video, and audio of every one since we started up production uh, again. All right. So with that out of the way, let me get into today's program. All of us are much more than what we do for a living. And yet, when we lose a job or have trouble finding another one, we feel like we're missing something important. But work is about more than just something to do with your time or to feed your family. For many people, work is an entry point into larger society. It can be a way to meet friends and form families even. It's also often the only way that we can come into prolonged contact with people who are different from us. After the 2016 election, a lot of mid-Atlantic media outlets sent journalists on expeditions to Midwestern diners to see how a man who lied constantly and had a long record of failed businesses and broken marriages was able to become president. Some of the stories that came out of those forays were good, but a lot of them just barely scratched the surface. And in some cases, got things wrong, even worse. In today's episode, I'm joined by Farrah Stockman. She's an editorial writer for the New York Times, but more importantly, she's got a new book out called American Made, what happens to people when work disappears? And we're going to talk about work and, and how, it, how it works for people today. So I hope you will enjoy the program. All right. Hey, Farah, thanks for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me. All right. Well, so, um, yeah, I wanted to congratulate you on the book. It is a really good one. Uh, let me put up the image on the screen there so everybody can see what it looks like. Um, and... Um, so it's, it is a multifaceted book, I, I think it's fair to say. Um, and I guess before we uh, talk about some of the, the things that you say in it, maybe let's discuss the format and, uh, and uh, uh, why you decided to write it. The format of the book? Um, yeah, yeah. How, lay it out. yeah. how did you structure it, basically? Yeah, so I followed three people. Um, basically, I'll just briefly tell your uh, viewers that I, I started kind of reporting the book literally on election night. I was sent to Wellesley College, Hillary Clinton's alma mater, and I was part of this big group that was set up to write about the... And where is that? Just oh, in, uh, in you know Massachusetts, right near my okay. house, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I was part of this big reporting team that w thought that we were gathering string for the his to write about the historic election of the first female president. And of course, uh, you know how that went to the night uh, turned upside down. And everybody at Wellesley College was wondering, how could this have happened? How could so many millions of Americans have voted for a man who had not even served one day in government and made him president of the United States? How could that be? Um, so I, uh, did I, did I lose you, Matt? Oh no, you didn't. I'm, okay. I'm just I'm <laughs> highlighting you. I'm, this is oh, okay, your okay. chance to shine here, Farrah. All right, okay. all right. I'll shine. I'll shine. Uh, you can put it back. Oh, oh, <laughs> you're muted though. I can't hear you. You're muted. Um, so uh, uh -oh. um, I I grew up in Michigan. I'm from I'm from the Rust Belt. So I started asking around, why mm -hmm. Donald Trump? And I kept hearing, his he's going to save my plant. He's going to save my factory. He's going to bring the factories back. 
And that's what made me decide to go to Indiana and follow uh, workers at a factory that was moving to Mexico, which uh, just a few weeks before the election, the bosses at that plant had uh, uh, announced that they were going to move to Monterey, Mexico. And right after the election, Trump tweeted about this plant. It's called Rexnord. It was it, it formerly Link Belt. And he tweeted like, no more, you know, this company is viciously firing 300 workers. So it was really kind of a microcosm of American politics at that moment. All these workers were hoping he was going to swoop in. He was feeding their dreams. And, um, you know, and a lot of the liberal uh, friends of mine were saying things like, oh, get over it. The factories are never going to come back. You know, how could they be so stupid to, to, to believe this guy? Um, so anyway, I, I went to Indianapolis and uh, followed three workers for seven months as the factory um, shut down. Uh, Shannon Mulcahy was a white woman, is a white woman, um, a single mother who had uh, started off as a janitor at that plant and worked her way up to become a heat treat operator, which was one of the most dangerous and highly paid positions on the factory floor. I also followed uh, Wally, a black guy who was very beloved at the plant and Harvard, he, he was one of the most optimistic people I've, I've ever met. Um, he had a dream that he wanted to start a barbecue business after the factory closed. And um, I knew I wanted to follow him to see if he did it. And I followed John uh, Feltner, a, a white guy who was the union vice president. This was his second plant closing. And he was uh, very angry, but also um, wasn't surprised that it was closing. And so, you know, I, I wrote this in the New York Times in the fall of 2017. And I ended up uh, writing a book and following them over the course of the Trump administration over four years to see like, where did they get jobs? What happened next? But also like, how did they get their jobs in the first place? Who trained them? Who, um, you know, how did their jobs impact their sex lives? Like, you know, what did that job mean to them? And what happened after it went away? That was the main uh, thing I was looking at when I started to uh, report the book. Mm -hmm. Now, did you, um, as I mentioned in the intro, there were some people who had this, you know, some media outlets were criticized for just doing kind of shallow reporting of of what's going on in, in the yeah. Midwest. Um, is that something that you had were concerned? I mean, you were interested in this before that criticism came out. So I don't think it influenced you. <laughs> but on the other hand, was that did you feel like this deserved a longer form treatment? Um, yeah, I mean, occasional article. Of, yeah, I think um, I think a lot of us don't understand what life is like in some of these places, and we are. My big takeaway from the whole experience was that my economic reality, as a person who graduated from college and graduated from a prestigious college my economic reality is so different than theirs. And it, it, and I was a foreign correspondent before I started working for the New York Times. I spent a lot of time abroad and I know what it's like to sit down and talk to people uh, in another place and how long it takes before you can truly understand what their lives are like, it, even getting a glimpse. And it took me more than a year of, of hanging out with and interviewing and observing Shannon, Wally and John, it took me more than a year before I even had a clue of what their job meant to them, how it worked, how their personal finances worked, um, you know, how did they get by and what did it mean when the job disappeared? And so, you know, it's kind of, I wanted to do the opposite of the usual political journalism, which is usually a political reporters dispatched to interview voters. You get one quote and you usually pick the quote that says what you already think. And if you're lucky, it's backed up by some opinion poll and boom, there's a story. But like, you know, that's not how people's lives work. People's opinions change over time. 
Their worldview is shaped by real lived experience, and it doesn't always conform to political categories. And every single one of us is a, a contradiction, right, politically. Um, so Wally was a Democrat. He voted for Hillary Clinton, but he had a gun. Oh, yeah, he had a gun and he really wanted he, he really appreciated his uh, right to have to own a gun. <laughs> he, it was one of the things he was most thankful about because he had served a stint in prison. And a, a lot of people sign away their uh, right to have a gun uh, at that point. And he was so grateful that a lawyer had not let him do that. Um, so everybody, ha mm -hmm. you know, John was a John voted for Trump. And yet um, he, uh, when he talked, sometimes he, he sounded like a Marxist. He was such a, he was such a, a heavy duty militant um, labor union guy. He believed in, he believed in the union. It was the core of his identity. And when he, you know, when he talked about the world, it was labor and capital, labor and capital. That was mm -hmm. the clear division. And so, um, you know, you wouldn't see those things if you didn't spend enough time uh, really not only talking to people, but interrogating their idea of the world until you felt like you understood it. Mm -hmm. um, so now in the case of John, though, also, um, and I, I he, because of his sort of mixed opinions, as you just described, yeah. um, I found him to be interesting because he also was a former democrat um as yes. well and he yes. had a long heritage of of in his family of being democrats yes. but he felt like the democrats had betrayed people like him right yeah 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 this was a big and specifically education. though how like how did what would okay. what did he say so um this was one of my biggest takeaways i went into the union hall um i interviewed him and his friend tim and both of them had very similar histories. They were both um, the grandsons of coal miners. You know, they came from coal miners, strong union families in Kentucky and Appalachia that were once sort of the pillar of the Democratic Party. And they had believed so strongly in uh, the Democratic Party that John, John used to tell his kids, if a Democrat's in office, old dad has a job. If a Democrat gets voted out, old dad's out of work. And uh, his friend Tim said, told me, my father would roll over in his grave if he knew I had ever cast a ballot for the Republicans, because he taught me that the Republicans were for the uh, greedy corporations and the Democrats were for the working man. And you don't, you don't cast a ballot for those, you know, for those greedy bastards, basically. And yet they both told very similar stories about how, you know, they had sort of tuned out of politics when Bill Clinton was in office. They supported him. They believed in him. They thought he was one of them. And then, you know, Bill Clinton signed NAFTA and said NAFTA is going to improve working class jobs, increase the number of blue collar jobs. It's going to make Mexico rich and rich enough to buy our products. and Mexicans aren't going to be coming across the border anymore looking for uh, menial work, right? Taking jobs from blue collar Americans. So um, they believed it. And then Bill Clinton did, uh, did uh, the China ascension to WTO, allowing China permanent trade with the United States. Uh, and so, you know, th those two things and the China's entrance into the WTO was even bigger effect than NAFTA, but those two things really dramatically changed factory towns in, in these swing states. Um, uh -huh. And uh, both John and Tim lost their jobs. Tim's job went to, to Shanghai. And, um, you know, they, they started to believe that uh, 
Clinton had gotten into bed with the corporations while nobody was looking. And they both said that they remember Ross Perot talking about the giant sucking sound that would happen when NAFTA was signed, that jobs would go to Mexico and we'd all hear this giant sucking sound. And they said at the time we thought Ross Perot was an idiot. And later they agreed Ross Perot was exactly right. And, you know, we got sold out. And, and so this was the first time I understood the depth of bitterness over NAFTA. There are people who, you know, why is Sherrod Brown still uh, an elected official in Ohio, even though he's a Democrat? He's there because he never voted for NAFTA. He didn't, he has, he never cast a ballot for any free trade agreement. That's why they still elect him. These are people who cast their ballots on trade. And so you can't think of a worse candidate in 2016 than Bill Clinton's wife. Bill Clinton is the man they hate now that they used to support, but now they hate because they blame him for the loss of factory jobs. They're, you know, and political identity, a lot of times, at least for these people, it really boiled down to who puts food on your table and do you have a job or not? And they just decided, you know, the Democrats have gotten into bed with the corporations. And so they didn't really like Mitt Romney, right? He was the kind of job, he was the kind of corporate stiff that was sending jobs away, right? They weren't excited about him. But when Trump comes along and Trump is talking about factory jobs and Trump is talking about tariffs on China, they loved it. They have been waiting for someone to say that kind of thing for years since, you know, since uh, Democrats kind of moved to the center on those issues. So um, it was a real education to me how much NAFTA was hated and how much that issue alone um, is what caused them to cast their ballots for Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I should say that their union uh, initially um, endorsed Bernie Sanders. And when Bernie Sanders lost the nomination, most of the leadership voted for Hillary Clinton. They said, we're going to hold our nose and vote for Hillary. But the membership voted for Trump. Yeah. Well, and I, and I think that that's an aspect about Donald Trump, his 2016 campaign in particular, that um, a lot of people missed, I think, in the political press that in a lot of ways, so not just with foreign trade, but also, you know, in, in a lot of other ways, Donald Trump kind of ran as a sort of left wing uh, old school Democrat. So like he said, he was going to have a health care system that took care of everyone. He said he liked Canada's socialized health care system. Yeah. He said he was going to close the carried interest loophole. He said, you know, I, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I know how the system works and I'm going to be, and they've been screwing everyone while well, I'm going to screw them on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, and yep. like a lot of people, you know, and, and people who don't pay attention to politics compulsively and because they have better things to do perhaps. Um, and, you know, or they just have too many other things going on. Right. And so if you have somebody who comes along and says to you, I'm going to solve all your problems, um, and, and by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to bring back Merry Christmas. Um, you know, why wouldn't you vote for him is, is the better question. The more I started to understand these, these steel workers and read their, they had a newsletter at the time called steel voice. And if you read steel voice, it was just like a Trump rally speech, like everything it was almost like he had ripped his speeches from steel voice. Everything he was talking about on TPP, on prescription drug prices, on um, the way American workers were getting screwed by corporations, by globalization, by elites who, who uh, didn't care about the working class anymore. It was all there. It was all there. And it wasn't entirely different than what Bernie Sanders was saying. When it came yeah. to when it came to globalization and the role that it played in in hurting American workers, yeah, um, no, that's true. And um, all right, well, so so we we've talked about John here a little bit. Um, now you you profiled two other people, uh, Wally, who was uh, he was a union official worked uh, worked with the company to help them 
you sort of liaise between the li the union and the company. At it. Um, and he was he's unfortunately uh, well, I, I don't know if, if you're trying to have a, a spoiler alert or not, but unfortunately, you know, he uh, he died actually during the course of the reporting of your book. Um, but can you talk about his story a little bit and and his perspective? Yeah, so um, Wally was one of the most beloved people at the plant. He had so many friends um, and he um, he really had one of the best jobs on the factory floor. He, he was kind of the efficiencies are, but they gave him like lots of uh, freedom to wander the plant, to, to make things more efficient at the plant. And um, he took it very seriously. He was a really hard worker when he had been on the assembly line assembling bearings he was the guy that always wanted to do more than the quota so if the boss said i want 100 of these bearings by lunchtime well he made sure to have 120. he was a really hard worker and in fact he was such a hard worker that a lot of the other his co-workers used to kind of talk about him behind his back oh he's an uncle tom or um some of them would just say, hey, why are you working so hard? Because when you work that hard, so do I have to work that hard. You're being inconsiderate, basically. If you're gonna, if you're showing them that, uh, that, you know, what we can produce if we really push ourselves, you're gonna, you're gonna make them raise our rate. You're gonna make them increase the amount we have to produce. So he was really, um, anyway, he was kind of a model worker in a lot of ways. Um, but, uh, he had as a youth gotten in trouble with the law and, um, and served a stint in prison. And so that was his reasoning. He was like, you know what? I'm blessed to have this job. And I, you know, I'm, I'm going to work as hard as I can because I was locked up and, you know, I know what it's like to be in the streets selling drugs. This is my way out. He actually was able to really get on the path of a, of a middle class life because of that job that paid $25 an hour, gave benefits and health care and all the, all the rest. And it really, his story really taught me that a job was like the difference between being, being taken care of by an institution that gave you access to all this stuff, sort of a life of paperwork. You know, you get a 401k, you have insurance and all this protection that he hadn't had as, as a younger man. He'd made a lot of money when he was a teenager as a drug dealer, and yet he didn't have health insurance. Um, and he came from a neighborhood of um, that had been once a, uh, pretty stable and integrated and his parents were his father had a had a master's degree from in engineering or a degree in engineering from Purdue and had you know been in the management of a factory and and his parents had really tried to set him right they went to church he, they they sent him to a christian private school and all this stuff but the neighborhood got worse and worse. And he just, he fell into a kind of a, a crowd of, of kids that were, you know, the, the, the bad influences were everywhere. And they, you know, in the end, he gets a girl pregnant and decides, okay, the only way I can support her and the baby is to deal drugs. So he actually made more money than his father at the age of 15, dealing drugs on the corner. And it just, you know, it caused me to learn so much about what happens to um, a place when all of the most ambitious young men go to one industry and it's an industry that is illegal, right? So um, anyway, Wally's, Wally's story was, was fascinating because he was a very entrepreneurial guy. He was the only guy in the plant that I'd met. I met him at a steelworkers rally where he was giving a fiery speech about, we got to stand and fight for our jobs. They're taking this they're taking these jobs away from all of us. You know, we got to stand shoulder to shoulder, black and white. We're going to, we're together in this. We're going to fight for our job. Afterwards, I introduced myself and he, I thought he'd still be, you know, angry and upset like all the white workers that I had interviewed up until this point. And he was, he was like, you know what? Ain't no use in being mad and crying about it. 
me personally, I'm going to start a barbecue. And he handed me a business card. He had a plan. He was the only one I'd met that had a plan for what was going to happen after the factory closed. A lot of his white co-workers were weeping. They were writing to Donald Trump every single day, begging him, begging Trump to save the plant. While he was like, God did this. God, God intervened so that I could start my barbecue. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Well, and I guess one of the other one of the other aspects to Wally um, that you noted that I that I thought was an interesting and accurate observation is you said that um, Wally's blackness gave him a certain psychological advantage over the white men who were traumatized by watching their jobs disappear. Black people were more accustomed to adversity, joblessness, and unemployment. Yeah. Is that something that, um, so I mean, given your own background, was that something that you already knew beforehand? Or was that something that you kind of saw anew in this reporting? I definitely saw it anew. I definitely, I mean, I definitely saw it anew. I'm the child of two PhDs. My mother is black, my father is white, but I grew up in a college town where everybody was, everybody in my high school uh, was on a, path to college. So um, I, you know, I have, I have cousins, I have a lot, much larger family that's, that's, that's experienced a lot of um, employment uh, issues. So I've seen it through them. But it wasn't in my, you know, Wally and following him made me understand it and confront it in a new way. Because I mean, the biggest mystery to me was, okay, if I'm following these workers in this factory and this factory is 40% black and the white workers are very, re uh, they're very receptive to Trump's message about keeping factories here. And they, the white workers are looking for a savior and they're willing to cast a ballot for him because they want their factory saved. Why don't the black workers who work in the same factory have the same analysis, right? Um, but they, they didn't, um, uh, while he couldn't stand Trump. And I think, you know, part of it was, um, that they worried that the message was racist. So right after the, um, right after the factory bosses announced that it was closed, um, and then the election happened. And then by December, they're bringing in Mexican trainees to learn the machines right? So what does John do? He goes through the whole plant saying, nobody train the Mexicans. Do not train them. If we don't train them, we can maybe save our jobs. If nobody trains them, they can't move the plant. So let's stand together as a union and refuse. No matter what bonus they offer us, let's say no. And whoever trains, by the way, is no better than a scab. That was John's message. And a lot of the Black workers were like, that and a scab is what? A, oh, a scab is somebody who uh, is somebody who uh, picket uh, who crosses a picket line, right? Um, so, which in a union household, there there's no name you could be called that's worse than that. That is the that is the worst thing you could be called. I mean, you and so fist fights started, or you know, friendships were ruined over 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 this dispute over whether or not workers should train their Mexican replacements. And a lot of the black guys heard that and said, that's racist. The decision not, you know, saying that we shouldn't train Mexicans is racist. A lot of the black well, it, it was also that's reminiscent. What they heard. Yeah, but it was also reminiscent of what happened earlier in the right. factory to right. their, either their parents or themselves. Right. So they um, were remembering when the white guys didn't want to train them or really there. They were remembering how poorly the union treated their fathers and their uncles. And the whole reason Wally got a job in that plant is that his uncle had been one of the first black men in that plant to operate a machine because his uncle had been hired after a long, you know, process and, and NWC, it took, it took like civil rights kind of, uh, fighting for Wally's uncle to get a job in that plant in the 60s, got a job as a janitor, 
And it took the Civil Rights Act to pass before Wally's uncle was given the right to operate a machine. And so, you know, that history of discrimination against Black people still matters because it caused this schism, right? It, it, the, the, the white guys were like, hey, you're my union brother. How, can, how come we can't stand together and fight this? But the, a lot of the Black workers were like, nah, I don't think you're really... You may you probably don't have my best interest in heart. And I remember the union's not really for me. I remember how well, the union yeah. treated my dad. Well, that, and that ultimately how was, that's how yeah. some of them felt. Not all, but some. Yeah. Well, and ultimately refusing to train the replacement actually wasn't going to really get you anything, ultimately. Um, and as it that's kind of how it happened, right? In 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 the story. I mean, it's interesting because we're now seeing a lot of strikes. We're seeing a lot of labor. Uh, we're seeing a reawakening of the labor movement that wasn't in existence in 2017. In 2017, when I was reporting this book, a strike was, you know, hardly contemplated. And, 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 and it, we don't know what standing together would have gotten them. We don't actually know that. But, um, you know, I'm, I tend to be of your view that it wouldn't have made a difference. But um, there are some people who say, look, the reason that unions have gotten weaker is that people stopped standing together and, and demanding things. And so anyway, it's, it's complicated. But at the time, the workers just they just fe fell apart. They, they divided over this issue. And many others, but there was the issue of when you started working the plant, were you a new guy who who'd come from another factory, and so you're only going to get a severance bonus of like three weeks, or have you been in that plant for you know for 48 years, like the union president, all right, and you're going to get you know three weeks for every one of those 48 years plus your pension. Um, so anyway, it was a it was a really I I was really eye opening to see how even though they all worked in that same plant, they had very different vantage point and even economic sort of incentives. Yeah. Well, and that brings us to the third profile subject in the book, Shannon, um, yeah. who uh, she was what, like 45 and a grandmother. Um, and, uh, you know, she was, and you, and you mentioned her, uh, what she was doing, you know, for the factory, but and in her case, the factory she came to the factory as a means of escaping from an uh, abusive relationship basically right yes yep yep she yeah she was actually 42 she was she's three months younger than me uh mm -hmm. or older than me um yeah we're the same age and um yet you know she's a grandma of a kid who wasn't that young right her her granddaughter was four at the time when um, her, so, yeah so she's um she, yeah, she was a fascinating person, not somebody I expected to find uh, in a as a, working as a steel worker in this plant. But um, she had, yeah, that job. That's what. That's how that job. That's how that job had transformed her life. It gave her not only the money but also the confidence to leave uh, a guy who who beat her up all the time and didn't want her to work and you know wanted her to be dependent on him. And, um, you know, she usually obeyed him, but when it came to, when she got a chance to get a job in that plant, which she got through her uncle, just like Wally, they all did, they all got jobs through their uncle. Um, uh, she, you know, she jumped at the chance and she wasn't gonna, she wasn't gonna give that up because to her, that job was a status symbol. It was like, you know, Link belt, link belt, which is what the factory was called when she got hired or called when she was younger. Um, it was, you know, a famous company. It was known to make the world's best bearings. It had its name on water towers and trucks. And, you know, when she told people that she worked at link belt, she could see the envy on their faces. That's how good a job it was for her. And so, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people, maybe if you have a college degree and you live in Boston and you and you read the New York Times, 
you think, oh, those factory jobs are such shitty jobs anyway. No one really wants to do that. Shannon wanted to do that job. That was yeah. the best job Shannon will ever have. And it was her dream job. Yeah. Well, and so like John, she didn't have a plan going into the closure of the plant. So what happened to her afterward? Right. So she kind of, uh, she was sort of living in denial for a long time. She worked in the heat treat part of the plant, which was the last to move. So she, her, she was, she literally was there almost until it shut down. She was one of the last people in that plant. And um, she decided to train her replacement because it paid an extra $4 an hour. And you know, she had agonized over whether she should do it or not. Is it moral or immoral to 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 train? And she ended up training uh, a young guy from Mexico, and she she forged like a friendship with him. Um, and she was very protective of him in the plant. She was afraid that somebody would attack him. And um, at the end of the training, he took her aside and he put his hand over his heart, and he was trying to apologize like I'm sorry that I'm that I'm taking your job and she said um you know I was blessed to have this job again using the word blessed I was blessed to have this job and I hate to see it go but um now it's your turn to be blessed and you know she really had the you know she really had convinced herself that this was a good thing because we should give to the less fortunate and Mexicans are less fortunate. Let him have the job. So she ended up, um, she wasn't quite sure what she was going to do after the factory closed. She stayed unemployed for a long time. And um, uh, part of the reason is that her son got very ill and his daughter relied on Shannon for everything, for caretaking. His daughter was disabled. And so Shannon was just like many uh, working class women. She was juggling childcare and being the primary breadwinner of the home. So that was one thing that kept her unemployed. And the other thing was that when my story came out in the New York Times about her, a very rich lawyer in New York paid off her mortgage. So her biggest fear was being homeless. And now all of a sudden this rich guy has played off her mortgage, which was a whole crazy story in itself. I only got into a tiny <laughs> portion of it in the book, but yeah, she had, she had this patron in New York who, who promised her a job in Vegas. He and his friend were so wealthy that they essentially split her, the cost of her mortgage uh, and I say in the book, it's like other men decide to split the cost of a deep dish pizza. I mean, they they had more thought process behind it, but it you know it, it wasn't it didn't hurt them that much to to share the cost for a mortgage. And and then this friend of the rich guy was building a hotel in Vegas, and they said, okay, Shannon, we're going to hire you when this hotel is built and we're going to give you a job. It's going to have a meaningful salary. We'll pay for your granddaughter to be cared for. And, you know, you'll never have to worry about anything in your life again. This was the, this was what she, I mean, it was just an unbelievable offer. And over the course of three years, we watch it kind of unravel as the, especially under COVID. So I don't know if you want me to catch you up to where she is now, but but she's had a more dramatic life than anyone I've ever known. And, um, you know, it, she just taught me a lot just about how people survive and how, how they, you know, women in particular in her situation. Oh no, now you, I can't hear you. Oh, okay. Actually, sorry. That was my fault. I, um, yeah, well, we can talk about, uh, maybe later, you know, uh, in, in the discussion where they are now. Um, but I guess one of the things that was, I, is kind of a, a consistent thing about all three of them is that, you know, their, their faith is very important, was very important to all of them. Um, and that's, it's an aspect of, I think, you know, a lot of Americans that, you just don't see covered very much. And, and that's one of the reasons that I started Flux, in fact, was that 
I felt like the national press didn't talk about um, faith matters or co faith controversies, and because these are these are real things that are that are important yeah. to people's lives, and and that are that also do in so many ways influence how, how they view politics, how they, um, what jobs they pursue, et cetera. And yet they don't get talked about very much. Um, is that, yeah. did, did they ever, like, what was their overall thoughts about, uh, about like, I, I guess in, in regard to Donald Trump, for instance, like what was, what do they think about him saying he was a, you know, the protector of Christians and th things like that? You know, I'm not sure they would even know he'd said that, mm -hmm. um, to be honest. Uh, the most religious person I followed was Wally, the black guy, mm -hmm. who was more, uh, he, was a, he was a believer in such a deep way. And uh, I went to church with him a couple of times. And, it, you know, he, the preacher had been in prison at one point and uh, came out and made it part of his mission to try to try to welcome uh, the formerly incarcerated into the church and so you know this the, the speech the the preach the preaching was a lot about uh god will provide if if you if you just believe in him god will make sure you, you can pay your car note you know there was a bit of prosperity preaching in there um, and a lot of those pastors were not for Donald Trump. I mean, in the black community, there, there weren't, at least in, in Indianapolis uh, in, and in Wally's family. I didn't see it. Um, uh, John um, was, had, had a, a, a spiritual life, um, but uh, I don't think it was organized religion was not his thing. He um, he told me that he got saved after his son almost drowned in a pool, and it, and didn't drown. And there were, and his son, and this was not in the book, but he he came when his son was um, you know was saved in the hospital, uh, was resuscitated in the hospital. He asked his son like, "Were you scared?" Like, and his son said, "Oh no, um, because." I, I was, Jesus was with me and he, you know, John was so um, appreciative that his son's life was saved and the whole miracle of it, that he came to believe in God, but he still didn't go to church after that <laughs> because he didn't believe in, or he, he was like, I'm, I'm a independent guy. He, you know, and I, I find that with, you know, a lot of people, you know, they have, a deep spirituality, but they don't necessarily get on board with all, all of that. Shannon, um, she talked about going to church every once in a while, especially with the abusive, uh, when she was with this abusive guy, she was like, yeah, the pastor was so cute. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't, you know, they're, they had different um, experiences with spirituality. Shannon, uh, was a believer in psychic mediums and the number of people in her world who believe in these crossing over psychic medium type people who are going to help you speak to your dead mother and find out, you know, you know, basically uh, cure your, your trauma from your childhood. Um, and they all, you know, Shannon had so much childhood trauma from abuse, from being sexually molested by her, stepdad like there was a lot and you know she and so many of her friends were into the psychic medium stuff which they did not see at all as um contradictory with god or with church but it was yeah. a different form of it was believing she was very willing to believe in stuff that was supernatural or you know so anyway um i i can't say that this was a place where when you're talking about um, Trump as a protector of Christians, I can't say I ever heard that in Indianapolis. I, what I would say is they saw those who supported him saw him as a protector of the working class and a protector of American factories. And if you listen to his rhetoric about you deserve your job because you're an American, 
you know, don't let the elites take this factory away because of their corporate greed. That was what really resonated with a lot of them. And the other part of the message that resonated, Shannon's father, who had been a lifelong I will never vote, did cast the first ballot of his life for Donald Trump. And he did it after his friend convinced him to start listening to Trump. And then part of the message that he really liked was oh, not only the factory is staying here, but also Democrats are always trying to tear down good people with accusations of racism and sexism. And Shannon's father had worked at the Wonder Bread plant for like 31 years and got fired by a black supervisor. And Shannon's father was convinced that she'd fired him because he was white. And yet he can't lodge an EEOC complaint because white people can't lodge EEOC complaints. So like I heard a lot of people, uh, the white workers complaining about these, this aspect of how, you know, they felt vulnerable to accusations of racism that could, you know, make them lose their job. And, you know, they appreciated this politically incorrect Trump, which they didn't, they didn't see that as ra as embracing racism. They saw that as embracing fairness, fairness. Yeah. But uh, yeah, well, and I guess, you know, you, you, one of the other things that I think was notable that I, I saw a number of times was that, you know, <clears throat> when you had mentioned various things about Trump, to the you know to people that you were talking to like they um shannon had never heard the the idea of, of trump saying that he could shoot someone on fifth avenue and it wouldn't it wouldn't harm his support like that and and that's something that you know somebody who came out of out of religious fundamentalism and um you know right-wing media that i think a lot of progressives who or just people who were born in that so non right wingers um you just have no idea that the media that they do consume doesn't tell them oh yeah almost no, the anything media was full it tells of... them nothing right that is contradictory or might make them look bad um and you know and then at the same time you don't like there are all these organizations out there that are trying to you know they're buying facebook ads and sh like trying to contact the average regular Americans constantly and nothing like that exists on the political left. No, I've heard that, um, that there's no, it's true because as liberal as the media can be or is accused of being, we are not in the tank in the same way, right? We, we we're really critical of Biden. We're critical of, you know, I mean, even, even the lefty activists are no, are, are, you know, it's not like Antifa is out there fighting for Joe Biden. He's not, right? They're not. Um, or they hate Joe Biden. They actually. hate Joe Biden, right? So <laughs> it's very, it's very, um, it's asymmetric. That's for sure. But yeah, for someone like Shannon, um, she was, when she was working at the factory, she was gone. Like she would work these long 12 hour shifts, sometimes like seven days a week. For months on end so you know she's not consuming the news the way that i'm consuming the news or the way that my my colleagues are consuming the news the average american who's working class is working class and doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of time um to 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 read the newspaper even if it was something they were inclined to do so i do think there's that in the in the um, if she if she had the news on it would be showing something like oh a steel mill roars back to life in gary indiana because of the steel tariffs that donald trump put on on steel and so now the american steel industry is coming back there's nothing shannon wants to hear more than that right so mm -hmm. um you know that's she's not gonna be put in contact with uh with other narratives and Frankly, a lot of other narratives are narratives of college educated people talking about things that college educated people care about and that affect us, right? So, I mean, one of my big takeaways from the book is that talking heads on the news 
and and people like myself were we were we were reflecting a certain view of globalization and, and we that view was free trade and globalization are great for the economy it's a win-win look at how our economy is growing look at how much more wealth that our country has now than it did before look how much you know how how much uh look at our supply chain and how diversified it is and how cheap everything is like that was that was the view and yet if you lived in a factory town that was decimated under nafta or under uh, after china entered the wto you saw a totally different picture right you saw if you lived in a town that made shoes and all of a sudden now all these cheap shoes or furniture right uh, textiles you know all of a sudden no one you know has a job right you've lost your job everyone you know has lost their jobs the the people on the news aren't reflecting your reality right they're not talking about anything that you know and that's fake news to them right that's fake news because because it doesn't matter it's irrelevant yeah what the aggregates the aggregate size of the economy doesn't speak to the health of individual people, families, or communities, right? And and you and we can just say, well, on average, American workers weren't harmed, but but that's taking the average of, you know, all of these white collar business people who, in the free trade deal, got the ability to invest in the insurance industry and the banking industry in Mexico, which is what NAFTA was really about, right? That was that was where the growth was. The growth markets are in Asia. The growth market. The, we want to get into those markets, and the people who are benefiting from that are not the average American worker, right? Only half of Americans own stock, right? So, I mean, we we talk about what's good for America, but American interests have all the time been defined by corporations and people with college degrees, and and you know. So I'm not saying that we're an evil cabal, but we're very divorced from the economic realities of everyday working people. And the policies that have prevailed uh, for the last 30 years haven't necessarily supported everyday Americans all over the country. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can say is, okay, now we have Walmart where we can buy a fleece jacket for much cheaper, right? But if you can't find a job, it doesn't matter really how much that fleece jacket costs at a certain, at the end of the day, Shannon's house was stuffed to the gills with things, right? Her boyfriend was a furniture mover. And so he would bring back the crumbs of what wealthy people threw off the stuff that they didn't want to take anymore. So her house was like a junkyard full of all this stuff. Cheap crap was not her problem, right? Her problem was where do I fit into the economy? Is there a place that's going to hire me and not just pay me, but give me a reason to live. Give me a reason to get up in the morning. Give me coworkers that respect what I do and look and and a function, uh, a, a place of respect, even though no one has certified me, even though there's no university that has put its stamp on me. And yeah. so what I found was that a lot of these workers, they knew, a ton of stuff. Keeping those old machines running was not an easy task, right? I don't know that I could have done Shannon's job. It wasn't just pushing a button. It was more complicated than that. And yet nobody respects what they do because they don't have a college degree. And I, I mean, to me, it's just like, it's astonishing that only a third of Americans have a four-year BA. Only a third of American adults over the age of 25 have a, have, have a four-year BA. And yet people who have that credential are making, and even higher credentials, are making all of the decisions of significance in this country. And mm -hmm. many of them are not aware of how those decisions are really affecting people who are actually the majority. And yeah. that's what that's what I think is the fundamental disconnect. And it's the fundamental, if, 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 if those, if we weren't so disconnected, I don't think our politics would be so bonkers right now. 
that's yeah. just that's just one of my, it's it's something I came to believe because if you look at Shannon, she's a person who went to high school, dropped out of high school. What was her? What was she learning in high school? She was not learning how to cast a ballot intelligently. She was not learning. She was being prepared to work in a factory that no longer exists. She wasn't being taught civics. You know, these are people who talk all the time. Oh, it's a free country and about the Constitution. They don't know the first thing about the what's in the actual Constitution, balance of powers, none of it. Like it, it, it was a profound disconnect between the knowledge you should have in order to, to, uh -huh. to cast an intelligent vote. But they did know one thing, that they'd been screwed. And, and the more I understood about their lives, the more I couldn't, I couldn't deny it. I couldn't yeah. deny that, that their reality well, that had not been taken into account. Yeah. And I guess one of the other things also beyond these policies that, you know, it negatively impacted their jobs. Um, it's also kind of the story of the failure of bureaucracy to help them as well, because, you know, there's, I think there, and there were, there are a lot of people that would like to go to college or let's say have some experience in a field but they don't have a certification for it. So like, and this is a real problem in the IT world that there's a lot of people who know how to, you know, program in some language or know how to run a server in certain ways because they learned it from experience. But all these companies are like, no, you have to have a certification in order to, to work for us. We'll not even talk to you. We won't even look at your resume unless it says certified X. Uh, but the problem is to get that certification, it costs you twelve hundred dollars, um, and they don't have that money. And you know, and and that story happened to some degree with the workers at the plant. That <clears throat> there were systems that were supposed to help them, but in many cases uh, were underfunded or didn't understand that the systems, the way they're constructed, are inscrutable and like this black box of men a menacing black box that just exists and you can't, and it's not for you. It will, doesn't care about you. So you've, you've touched on three areas. One is college and the accessibility of college. And uh, I saw John's daughter uh, took out a lot of loans to get a, uh, you know, to be the first in her family to graduate with this college degree. And when he lost his job, she dropped out and ended up um, coming home for a while. I still think she's going to finish, but um, but John had very he was very skeptical about whether taking tens of thousands of dollars in loans for room and board to to get a, a BA was going to pay off. And he had life experience to say that it might not. So I think something. Um, something like a third of American adults have had some college, if you call it, maybe they have an associate's degree, but more likely they've taken some college classes and dropped out with yeah. debt, right? Well, and the inflation of college tuition is, is literally the, the worst commodity in the United States, like by a, far worse. To uh, John, no one ever talks about it. Yeah. To John, it was like a Ponzi scheme where all, you know, the, the, the students have to have to pay all this money so that the rich professor can, you know, can have a job and teach a class that was actually not going to get the student a job uh, that was going to. And I, it was, you know, when you're talking about well-known colleges, that's, you know, I can say, look, I've, I have, a, I don't have more than a BA and I make a really good living. Right. But but I'm not sure that somebody graduating with a lot of debt from Indiana State or, or, or you know, is, you know, you're not sure. Because if you're a working class person, you're, you're working while you're going to school, right? So you're also, you're also trying to balance waitressing or this, that, and the other with, with getting your college degree. And we, we only talk about the success stories. We don't talk about all the people who drop out and have compound interest debt to pay back. So the, the very notion that we should have a society where everyone has to go to college and that's the norm, right? The norm is offensive to someone like John because he thinks you actually don't need that 
to you can make a really good living in the trades. You can make a really good living um, uh, 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 fixing machines without a four-year college degree. And um, I, you know, I I think that we we have to respect uh, have a little bit more respect for the trades because those are jobs that people can make a good living on. And, and, um, I, I also want to say that when you talked about the, the software developers, you know, I know a lot of software developers that had jobs, American software developers that had jobs, and then they were outsourced to big companies that brought in H1B visa, people, folks from India who are here for three years and then get sent home. And, you know, there's a whole industry of bringing people here and insourcing, uh, insourcing these tech jobs. So it's like, you know, or globalization makes it possible to design code, even if you're in Kenya or Ukraine, and you're going to, you know, your cost of living is much cheaper there. So you you don't, you're not going to be paid the same amount. So I mean, I think that there's, there's a fundamental problem in in the modern world today, which is that we're still in these nation states that have laws, and the way to get um, justice and to get a to get a good living, right, is to have a labor movement that lasts for minimum wage, and to to get companies pass laws and get companies to you know abide by environmental standards and give health care and all this stuff. That's what the left has been doing for so many years, get companies to be responsible for their workers. But then when those companies turn around and move the factories or outsource that work to, to, to folks overseas who, who can do it cheaper, we don't have a response, right? We don't have an answer to, to that. And, and so, you know, that's where it, we have this um, this idea of the soulless globalist, right? That's 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 a thing that 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 conservatives talk about or Trump supporters talk about, and it comes from this notion of, you know, the person who used to hire you and pay your bills is now searching all over the world for someone else to do your job cheaper, and um, they don't care about you. They're not allegiant to you. They don't live in this community, and it all that matters is is cost. And efficiency, and um, I, you know, I. Well, I, and to the sorry, and to the extent they think about poverty, um, the way you put it was that they're more they think more often about poor people in Kenya than about poor right. people in the United States or disadvantaged right. people. That's the, the that's the that's the that's the the knock that they get right, and 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 so I I mean I I feel like um, we could do a much better job of at least expressing empathy when people lose their jobs instead of saying, oh, the factory's gone, get over it, which is which is a real sentiment. And there's a real feeling among many that, okay, you know, a huge number of Americans are never going to be employable. And so let's just give them UBI. Let's just give them universal basic income, get a check in the mail. All we got to do is, is, is redistribute this income. And if you're just, but if you think about it, people who don't trust the government all that much are very suspicious of the notion that they're going to live off a check on the mail, a check that comes from the government. I went with John to go collect his John, I was following John when he had kind of a problem with his um, unemployment insurance money coming through after the factory closed. And he had to run this gauntlet of government offices. It was like a full time job just to get like a three hundred dollar check. Yeah, it's it's offensive what what these agencies put people through. It is. And he said, I, I am doing this because, well, one, we need to pay the rent. But two, I paid into the system my whole life. But if it was a system he hadn't paid into, he would have done anything to to avoid to avoid it. He would have taken four jobs, you know, or whatever. He was not going to live off welfare. And that was the thing that a lot of people don't understand about the working class, at least among the steel workers I followed. They looked down on the idea of welfare. They were very proud not to have to rely on it. And if they had someone in their family, which so many of them did, had people in their family who relied on it, it was like, well, 
you know, I'm not like them. Because work is the dividing line between you and the, and your you know neighbor who takes drugs, or you and your son who won't get off the couch and 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 do something for himself. It was um, and so I I just think that yes, redistribution is part of the answer. But if it's redistribution for people to live and do not you know, during COVID, a lot of people got those checks and we had to do that, but. It doesn't actually, un, mass unemployment doesn't produce a healthy society, right? We lost 90,000 people to opioid overdoses in 2020. That was a 30% increase over the previous year. So we know that people who are sitting around without jobs are not necessarily healthy people. And we'd have to have a really big rethink of our society um, and I know this is sort of runs against the grain of the big quid and the great resignation or whatever, but like unemployment is studies from all over the world show that it is cor highly correlated with uh, mental health issues, right? Yeah. People well, but a lot of that though, with the, the mass, the, the big resignation or whatever you want to call it, it's all, it's that people have realized that their employers were exploiting them also. Um, and so that's what a lot, because I mean, like, um, like the idea of the, of the corporate office, um, for a lot of jobs, unless you're making a, a product with, you know, where you physically have to be around other people, um, it's not necessary. And the reason that it exists is not economically sustainable ultimately it's not efficient it is actually less efficient economically and it's bad for the environment the, these these uh gigantic massive glass covered buildings that are just energy waste and all the um driving that it makes people do like mm -hmm. the corporate office should not exist in for most for a lot of things like especially for white collar work and and yet even and that's one of the things that from the in the pandemic, I thought that a lot of business leaders would learn this, that because they were able to perform their their operations without having their office, that they would realize, oh, gosh, you know what? I was wasting my money paying for this. I could I could get by, you know, and having people have a hybrid environment or like a, a retreat type work environment where you work from home most of the time. But then you have you know, like a week long retreat for people like that was how I ran my business uh, when I was doing uh, right, uh, right wing marketing and web design and production like and the people that worked for me, they loved it and I loved it, too. Like, but there is this sense that I think among a lot of older executives that, well, this is just how I was used to it. This is how it's always been done to have an office. And plus, you know, I just don't know if these people are, are doing their job. Uh, I can't, I don't trust them to be working for me if I can't see them. Um, and it's really antiquated. And, and even in the news business, like, it's so ridiculous that, you know, I see so many uh, people who work in media that have, you know, can't find a job now or have been laid off. And so they had to move to somewhere lower cost and then they go in and look at job listings and it's like, must live in New York, must live in DC. And it's like, you're covering politics, but you say it's okay to live in New York. Like the senators are not coming to New York. Uh, you living in New York has no benefit to you as a politics reporter or writer. Um, so like, it's just the same as if you were living in Indiana or if you were living in Philly or Los Angeles or, Ohio, like it doesn't matter. They're not coming to you. You're not seeing them <laughs> if you live in New York. Yeah, I think we'd be better off if more political reporters moved moved out to the that heartland, full of those place, you know, places that that people rarely go. And maybe mm. we're going there. Maybe you know, maybe as as maybe that's the future. Maybe we're seeing we're seeing that in the knowledge industry. If you have an internet connection, you know. I, that could be a silver lining of COVID that people end up fanning out around the country more and getting to know each other a little bit better. And, and I think that that would be a healthy thing because, you know, when everybody, you know, from a, from your Harvard class of 96 is living in one of three cities or one of four cities, you know, I mean, maybe that's a, maybe that's a, 
overestimation, but it like there's not that many people who are, who who I know who are in in places like Indiana now, and they you know that's a that's a brain drain in, inside our own country. Um, yeah. So I do think that that. It, yeah. For the knowledge economy, people can, in fact, work the way you're talking. But waitress, no, they have to go to work. Truck driver, they have to show mm -hmm. up. Bus drivers, cashiers, a tattoo artist, yeah. people who run gyms, personal trainers. I mean, I guess personal trainers started to do things on Zoom. But like, there was a real divide in 2020 between people who could work without putting their lives at risk and those who couldn't, those who had to show up in person. And... Um, so that was a that was also something that was interesting. Yeah. Well, no, I guess uh, in terms of the pandemic, like um, uh, just recently, the Atlantic published an article. I don't know if you saw it by some guy who lives in rural Michigan, and he said, uh, you know, where I live, no one cares about COVID. Um, now, was that? Uh, I, your book is is earlier in the pandemic covering, but so like later subsequently, I mean, did you see that kind of um, resistance to taking it seriously? Look, I'm from Michigan and spent like last summer on a cow farm in Albion, Michigan. So, um, I you know, there are places where people weren't thinking about COVID and Maybe they don't have to think about it. And, you know, we're not all the same. If you live in an apartment building in Manhattan and you can't get in and out of your building without touching an elevator button that 100 people earlier that day had touched, you're going to have a different... in that enclosed elevator. <laughs> right. You're going to have a different view of COVID than if you live in a cornfield and you have five neighbors, <laughs> like, and they live five miles away from you. Like, we're not the same. And if you look at politics urban rural divide is real it is real like even i'm in i'm in massachusetts right now 20 minutes outside of boston are cornfields where you'll see trump signs why is that right in texas in the cities they're all blue i i you know if we want to find a city that's not blue let me know where it is but 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 there's a there's a reason for that and you know it's not always, it's not, uh, I guess we don't all have to be the same. And so I do think, um, it, you know, I, I, my dad has a cabin and my parents have a cabin in Northern Michigan um, and we've been there and yes, there were nobody wearing masks up there and there were tons of Trump signs and, you know, you can keep your distance and you can, all, you know, I'm not saying that there are, there's not a lot of denialism that that's unhealthy. Um, but I also think it, you know, if, if in a rural area where there's not as many people and nobody's travel, traveling, right? Nobody's traveling overseas in the beginning of COVID. It nobody's was nobody's coming in. Nobody's coming in. So it's 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 quite, you know, and New Hampshire was like that. I, I used to um, spend time in New Hampshire and they were all out in the bars. You could see them. And um, but but it was also in a way there weren't very many people coming in and out from places where there were hot spots. So I guess I don't know. To me, I usually um, I yes, there are um, insane things going around, but I also look for for uh, reasonable reasons why people act the way they do. And if you know, <laughs> there are, there are a couple. There are a mm -hmm. couple. Um, yeah, well, and I guess uh, maybe that's a, a good final topic here. Um, and that is, you know, I, I think covering the closure of a factory and people, hundreds of people going jobless, like uh, it, it, people, it could be seen as a depressing book. Um, but I don't, you know, that's it. I don't think it was if you actually read it. Um, is that... Have people said that to you? They've asked you if it was depressing to write your book, and what what did you think? Yeah, there there are a lot of people who who have assumed that it was depressing for me, and I actually came away feeling more optimistic about the country because I realized, you know, yes, Shannon, Wally, and John had huge challenges, but 
I realized what uh, like great people they were, <laughs> even though um, they uh, you know often said things that drove me crazy. Um, I realized they weren't bad people, and um, and I realized how much more they had in common with each other than they did with um, the CEO that was sending their job away. And, uh, you know, the average American has a lot in common with each other. And if we could just kind of get, and, and they loved each other uh, in that factory. They really had a camaraderie um, often across lines of race. I'm not saying it was all unicorns and rainbows, but um, they had a bowling team. They had, they went to Colts games together. They, they went fishing together, hunting. And there was a lot more friendships that than I expected to see in some parts of the plan. I won't say it's everybody, but um, I, I just came away feeling like uh, they weren't the caricature that um, that they're often portrayed. And we can learn from them. And uh, you know, I'm hopeful that if we start a conversation. Um, that's really listening to people on the ground. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get somewhere, rather than um, I don't know lecturing them about what their how we know more about their interests than they do, and why don't they vote their own interests? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, I think that's that's true, and and a lot of it just simply is that you know in our narrow cast and customized social media networks it's so easy to become isolated and just with people like you um and th and that's something that i think as i mentioned in the intro that you know work for a lot of people is the, the only way that they really come into contact with people different from them and so as that becomes you know difficult more, harder to sustain that type of environment we need to, to to look for other ways to to have connections and to and to and to talk to people and and that's especially true for for us in in the media industry that uh, you you can't assume that people have read some article that you know came out a month or two ago and be like yeah see I don't want to write that article again because we already wrote that article yeah mostly uh, you can assume they haven't read it because <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's 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 so much great stuff being written, and most of it's not being read by by ordinary ordinary folks. So, I think we have to work harder to, uh, you know, be in conversation with them. Yeah, I agree. All right. Well, um, so this has been a great conversation, Farah. Um, I'm going to put the book up on the screen. Your your book is American Made: What Happens to People When Work Disappears. And uh, you also are on Twitter at F Stockman. That's S T O C K M A N. So thank you for being here today. Hey, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. All right, and uh, if you can stick around just a little bit after, so sure. we can uh, run the uh, the ending clip here. Okay, cool. All right. Um, okay, so that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it and. Um, Please do check out Farah's book. It's it's a, an important one, and it's good to look at how there's multiple angles to the divisions that we have in our society today, and also to see that we have a lot more in common than it may otherwise see, and to get out and see other people and see what they're talking about, and to learn from them and maybe teach them a few things here and there. Um, all right. Well, so and then uh, just wanted to remind everybody that uh, Theory of Change is uh, part of the Flux Media Network. That's flux.community. And we are a nonprofit um, website that brings together podcasters, writers, and uh, we host live discussions every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. And then also we're doing Theory of Change on Thursdays usually, but today we're doing Friday. So uh, please do check it out. It's flux.community. And if you like what we're doing, you can go to patreon.com slash discoverflux and 
get some uh, extra podcast episodes um, as well. So please do check that out. And uh, I will see you. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Uh, I'll see you next week. Thanks. I'm Matthew Sheffield.